to us, Lord, and through your word. Lord, we ask you for the fullness of your spirit right now, Lord, to go upon us, overflowing. Lord, uh, we need you, and Lord, we need to die to self and let the fullness of the spirit have its way, Lord. So we love you, and Lord, we thank you that the word is alive and living. May you be in the midst of all that we talk about today. May it go from our head, knowledge, to our heart, Lord, to just our who we are in Christ, and to our hands and our feet, Lord. And thank you that we can worship you, give you glory, and allow you to be number one in our lives, Lord, as we think of uh, who you are and what you've done. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we continue to go through the outline, which I provided, um, lots of notes here. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but last week we covered Jesus is the center of all worship, and then we also covered point two, Jesus is the preeminent one in all things. And today, Lord, really, we're going to cover Jesus is the one to receive all the glory, point three, and then the deity of Christ, and then the Trinity. So, Lord willing, we've got to press through a lot. I won't be covering all the scriptures. I'll be sharing, and Brian will come up and, and uh, share some. We'll take some time to do as the Lord leads. We're just free in, in the Lord. Amen to that. Amen. All right, let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. As we just press through, Colossians chapter 1. On your outline, again, we won't be following everything, but uh, maybe adding some scriptures as the Spirit may lead, but Colossians chapter 1, let's read 27 through 31. Again, we're following through an outline so you have some notes, and I encourage you after the class even to go write down some of the scriptures that we didn't have time to cover. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I mean, I'm sorry, I meant to say Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I've got too many notes there. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 through 31. It says, But God has cho chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. You know, we all qualify. If you're foolish and you're weak, you're a perfect person that the Lord can use. Praise the Lord for that. And the base things of the world and things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh, verse 29, should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You know, they had the Super Bowl this week, this last week, and a lot of people were worshiping the football, right? <laughs> the team, right? But you know, we as believers in Christ were to give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen for that. He takes the broken, the hurting, the foolish, the small, the simple, and he brings them to a place where they can have power because it's his power in and through them. And when you realize what God has done in your life, all you want to do is give him glory. Amen? Amen. Give him glory. Galatians chapter 6. I just love to worship the Lord and just give him glory because I know where I was, I know where I came from, and I know where I am now. And I know where I'm going, right? You know, in this world, in this season, it's crazy what's going on out there. You guys have been listening to some of the things. You can't even tell what's right and wrong. It's crazy. But you know what? The Word of God is the same forever. Jesus is the same forever and ever. He's our foundation. He's our rock. He's our guarantee, right? He's the one that we want to give all the glory. And He, he receives all that glory. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. God forbid. Who are you going to boast in? 
You know, boast in Jesus, man, for what he's done. It's amazing what he did. You know, as I think of this passage, I was thinking, as for me, may I never boast about anything except for Christ Jesus and the cross. My interest in the world has been crucified, and I have no worldly interest left but to pursue, pursue Christ alone. Isn't that amazing, right? Wow, think of Paul. You guys don't know my testimony, but um, as a young man, I was a dancer. <laughs> I used to dance and win dance contests. Um, then I became a motorcycle racer. I could do the splits and do all this kind of stuff. And uh, um, this was a long time ago. But then uh, I sought after, uh, you know, I thought I could be happy as a Christian by making a ton of money and retiring. So about the age of 30, I basically retired with uh, millions of dollars and um, had five or six different companies and big houses and all this other stuff. But you know, as I look back, people go, wow, that's so cool. And for me, it was all a waste, all a waste. You know why? Because I started to put my trust in the world and the world systems and material things. And guess what? That will never bring any happiness. Ultimately, happiness, joy. You know, I can remember living in a house, is it seven bedrooms, six, seven, eight thousand square feet, horse property, gated community, and I was so sad. The dream that I had, if I only had a million dollar house, if I only had a million dollars, chase this goal, and then when you get there, it's empty and void. Me and my roommate, a friend, we used to do 360s backwards coming out of my driveway, from the driveway in the porch and just spin backwards, right? And that's what we got out of it. And it's like, what a waste. Have you ever, remember when you were a kid, you got the bicycle and it's like, ah, oh, this is the greatest thing. Or you got that little car, you know, I see the park, the kids driving in the car. And as soon as you get it right, it's good for a small season. What's next? Okay. I'm past this, right? And so the one that can only satisfy is Jesus Christ. The world will never satisfy you. It's only Christ that will satisfy the depths of your heart, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? And his righteousness, right? And all these things will be added up to you. You had a question? Yeah, uh, which doctor are we covering first? I missed it. Which what? Which doctor are we covering right now? We're covering Jesus is the one to receive all the glory. It's on your outline. Is it the one you got earlier? It's the one you passed out last week. It's uh, for two I'm weeks. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so as we continue, let's turn to John chapter 16. chapter 16, verse 14. Amazing passage. In John 16, 14, it says, The Holy Spirit, He will glorify me, speaking of Jesus Christ, for the Holy Spirit will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Wow! The Holy Spirit will bring glory to Jesus by declaring the truths about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? What's the Holy Spirit? Part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to Jesus, right? It's amazing, right? He points us to Jesus, right? Uh, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at 9 through 11. Therefore, or because God has highly exalted Jesus and given Jesus the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess 
that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, man. You want to glory? Glory to Jesus, man. Worship him, right? He's the one to receive all the glory. Why? Look what he did. The Father gave him a name that was above every name. Every name will bow. I always tell people, you're going to bow now or you're going to bow later. If you bow later, well, right before the judgment, right? Where you'll be separated from God throughout eternity. Wow. Bow now. Worship him now. Give him glory now. Let him be number one in your life. Wow, it's amazing. Let's turn to Philippians 3.3. 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and we rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Oh man, you know one of those great truths you have to learn is to have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh, your old nature, will not have anything to do with eternal values. Right? We have to die to self every day. Die to self means reckon that old man, that old nature, that Adam nature, dead, so that you can be alive to Christ. Another way you could put this, for we are the circumcision, those who are born again, and we worship God in the spirit, and we receive and give glory to Christ Jesus, what he has done for us, and we have no confidence in what we have done. What did we do? You know what we did? We received a gift, okay? By faith, right? We reached out, right? By faith, we put our trust in the grace of God, right? In what he has done, right? It's amazing. How can we take any credit? I didn't die on the cross. I'm a wretched sinner. I'm still a sinner, right? I couldn't save myself. I couldn't buy heaven. I couldn't get to a position to get to heaven. No one could offer it to me except for Jesus Christ alone. And he's the one to receive all the glory. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his work, to do his will, working in you just as well, pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a great truth. What a great truth, you know, to know. Just think about this. Now may the God of peace who brought our Lord Jesus Christ up from the dead. Wow. Through his blood, through an everlasting covenant, he made us alive. That he may equip you and me with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit every good thing that is pleasing to him. Wow. Wow. What a prayer, man. Wow, what a prayer for us that we might then give glory to him forever and ever. Wow, amazing. All right, I'm going to have Brian come up. Remember, this is, Jesus is the one to receive all the glory, right? Praise the Lord. here in the room, Lord, we pray you bless these guys and these girls, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, Jesus, we worship Jesus, right? Amen? All right. You know, um, it's, it's interesting because 
Um, he's the Lord thy God, right? It says him you will worship. We need to, we need to make sure um, that we're praising him and worshiping him. Amen? Because he says, I am the he does, he's the Lord thy God, right? And so we want to make sure. It's it's interesting. Um, you know, I was thinking about this thought that you're gonna get into trouble. Right? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all, right? So we're gonna get into we're gonna get into situations, we're gonna get into trouble. Um, but the Lord, you gotta remember, the Lord's gonna help you. You know, the Lord will deliver you, the Lord will help you in your time. He said, Call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will help you. I will deliver you, right? And so what we want to do is make sure that we're praising the Lord before it happens and in it happens. While it's going on, we want to make sure we're praising the Lord because he will deliver you, amen? Uh, let me read in Psalms 107. And this is, uh, I was just thinking about this psalm when, when I was over there, but uh, Lord, we pray you speak to us through your word. Now, he says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. He's gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of all their distresses. He led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Those who sat in darkness in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons because they rebelled against the word of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of all their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death. Oh, he broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works for the children of men. He has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Fools because of their transgressions. Because of their iniquities were afflicted, their soul uphold all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of all their distresses. He sent his word, and he healed them, and he delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Amen? Amen? I love that. Over and over, right? Then they cried out to the Lord. And you know what? It's the same um, with you. You're going to, you're going to, the Lord wants you to know when, when they went into the promised land, the children of Israel, that they were going to get into trouble. Right? You're going to get it done. You know, no one here, God doesn't use perfect people, right? He uses, as he said, right? He said, let him who glories in this glory that he knows and understands God. He, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. If he used perfect people, he, wouldn't, he couldn't find any, right? If you look at David's mighty men, David, um, and said, the, all the mighty men that were gathered to David was everybody who was in debt, who was everybody who was distressed, and everybody who was disquinted. And they became his mighty men, Right? God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise because he's the one that's going to receive all the glory, right? He says, let him who glories, glories in this that he knows and understands me. He does things. God's going to do something. And, and what he wants us to do is just praise him and thank him. And in here, you know, it says that then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from all their distresses. He will help you. God is going to help you no matter what. He's going to help you. He said he would do that. Now, he says, um, he says, as they pass through the valley of Baca, he makes through a spring 
God will help her just at the break of dawn, it says. Sometimes it's not for the last minute. Sometimes it's not the last. Hey, weeping may endure in the evening, but joy comes in the morning. Sometimes you're thinking, there's no way. I remember being in Haiti and several times saying, Lord, if you can pull this one off. I mean, this thing is such a mess. There is no way that this thing can work together for good. But if you can fix this, you can do everything. And what happens? He fixed it. And I have those things, those Ebenezer stones that I've stepped that I've set up, and you have too. And those are what are going to help you to remember what God's going to do in the future. You remember um, when David went against Goliath? He said to Saul, and he goes, oh, there was a lion and there was a bear, right? And the same God that delivered me from the mouth of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine, amen? amen. And so listen, we, what we want to do is you want to make sure you're praising him. Uh, you're praising him when I was in the school of ministry, it was interesting. Uh, I remember um, Carl Wesselin, the teacher once, he said, look, it's not the spiritual warfare. We're all gonna be, we're all gonna experience warfare, right? We're in a battle, right? And so it's not the spiritual warfare, it's how you respond to it. It's how you respond to it, 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 it if it's effective. Because the warfare is gonna get you to respond in the wrong way. Right? If all of a sudden something happens and I freak out and start yelling at everybody and throwing everything, then the attack was effective. But if I praise the Lord, if I thank the Lord, hey, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And if I'm thanking the Lord and praising God, guess what? That attack wasn't, didn't work. They're going to have to try something else. Um, and this is so important that we praise the Lord because um, he... Hey, it's the fellowship of his suffering. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, right? It says, don't consider it strange. These fiery trials that have come your way to test you. But it's the fellowship of the suffering. But it's the power of the resurrection. Amen. He's going to deliver you. He will help you just at the break of dawn. And so what we want to do is we want to just be praising the Lord and thanking the Lord and everything. Have you seen this? Steve has seen this in the mission field. You see people... They're like, oh, praise God, I lost my suitcase. You're just like, what? What are you talking about? Oh, man, I don't know. Maybe when I go back to get it, God's going to have a divine appointment. Something's going to happen. When you have someone like that, they are walking in the Spirit. They are praising the Lord, and they are glorifying God. Hey, when they went in, when the ten spies went into the promised land, right? They, went, they all saw the same thing. Hot walled cities, giants. And what did, what did Joshua and Caleb came back? Praise the Lord! What do you mean, praise the Lord? Man, we're, God's going to deliver them. Oh, we got it. Praise the Lord, right? And what happens? God inhabits the praises of his people, and those were the only two people able to go in 45 years later with the kids. Why? Because they, they know with God, nothing is impossible. We just say God is the one who gives life to the dead. He causes those things that do not exist as though they did. And if God said it's good, like he did, if God said everything's going to work together for good, then hey, what do we do? We just thank him and praise him. <laughs> Amen? It's really important because this is the arena of faith that God wants us to have. Hey, just thank me and everything give thanks for this is the will of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I remember uh, when we were in Haiti, I remember two instances. One time uh, when we were in Haiti, and then another time when we were in France. And um, my, it was one of these guys brought his wife, and we were doing a mission trip, an uh, evangelistic mission trip to France, and we were on a layover, and the lady lost her bag, her suitcase, and she just had a total meltdown in front of all the kids and the whole team. This is terrible. Why my bag? Why my bag? You know, and this whole thing, and it ruined, I mean, it just ruined her. It was, a, it was a disaster. Nobody even really. And so then I, I think about that on this side. And then I think about these two kids that came, um, these two young kids that came over for the summer from New Jersey. And these two kids came over and they went to get their bags. And this is, you know, their, their clothes for the summer and they weren't there. And now I'm like, oh man, this is going to be interesting to see how they respond. Amen. 
And so anyway, these kids get there. They're like, oh man, Pastor Brian, don't worry, we didn't need those bags. They were just that we got our we got our clothes right here. We're good. And man, I'm telling you, these kids, they 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 would wash, I could see them, they would be out in the back washing their shirts, you know, and washing their socks. They didn't have they didn't have their suitcase for on a, on, a, on a trip. And it was amazing. They didn't their bags came in one week before they left from Haiti. And it was like they were just thanking the Lord and praying. And the Lord provided new shirts and new shirts and everything for them. But it was such amazing because I'm like, man, those kids were the greatest example for me. Because here they are. I mean, how would you like to go on a trip and lose my suitcase, right? Oh, my toothbrush. Ah, right? And, and, but it just, that, and they had an amazing time because they're thanking the Lord and they're praising the Lord as opposed to someone who's like just freaks out. So. Um, hey, listen, let me read Revelation chapter 4. Who, he, Jesus, as he says, uh, Jesus is worthy to be praised. Um, man, this is like, we gotta, can, I got to remember this. You got to remember this. Because if we can remember to thank him and to praise him, that is the arena that he works in. And that's what glorifies him. It says in um, Revelation chapter 4, after these things I looked. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So um, this, is, um, this is when we're raptured up into the throne room. And this is what's happening around the throne room. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like jasper and sardis stone in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robe, and their crowns of gold in their head, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps were before, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. And the uh, first living creature was like a lion. And the second living creature like a calf. And the third living creature was the face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures each having six wings full of eyes all around within. And they do not rest day or night. They do not rest day or night. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and is to come. Amen? The first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Right? Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your um, will they exist and were created. Amen? So if you want to know what you're going to be doing in heaven, you're going to be worshiping the Lamb, right? Because he is worthy. He says, I am the Lord thy God, and I give my glory to no other. He does things that no one else can do, right? You might have mountains in your life. Uh, it doesn't matter. He said, You go tell Zerubbabel, that this mountain will become a plain. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, save the Lord. Amen? And so you just cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And he says he wants you to come. He says, call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will answer you and show you great and awesome things that you know not. So what do you do? If you get into trouble, you just praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Why? Because it's going to work together. All things are going to work together for good for those who love God or are called according to his purpose. Amen? And so we're just going to thank the Lord. We're going to praise the Lord. He inhabits the praise of his people. And uh, we know that that's the arena that he works in. Amen? He's looking for that. That's faith. Faith is saying, I know it's going to work together for good. I don't have the money. I don't have it. I'm, whatever. I know God. Hey, and, and, and God's like, really? Okay. And without that faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? So we want to just thank Him and praise Him. And I, this is an important thing. 
Um, you guys are all going into ministry. We're all, you know, we're, we've all we've all answered the calling, and so um, we want to just walk in the Spirit, right? We want to walk in the Spirit, and walking in the Spirit is trusting in the Lord. Our trust is in Him, who rose and died on the cross and rose from the dead. Amen. Hey, listen, they put Him in the grave, and they thought it was over. And so when they came to the tomb on the third day, the angel said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, man. So I'm going to let Steve take over. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man. How exciting. The worship of Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, man. All right. We're going to move on to our next topic. Um, the deity of Christ. And uh, it's so important for us to be able to show people that Jesus is God, right? And, uh, you know, I always take people right away to Colossians and it just blows their mind. But, uh, you know, more and more, I, I meet people that are so-called Christians. And they, they say they love Jesus. And they probably do. But, you know, they think of him as a good person, a good prophet. Almost up to God, right? They make him less than God. You know, if Jesus isn't God, he cannot save. You have to understand that Jesus is God. He's fully God, and he's fully man. That's what's speaking of the deity of Christ. You know, so often, we're going to see this now, I've heard people say, well, Jesus never said he was God. <laughs> Let's go through some scriptures. Okay? You know, all right, um, <clears throat> The deity of Christ. Let's look at um, John chapter 1. Good place to start. You know, whenever I, um, I'm ministering uh, to people that are unsaved, I always try to get them to read God's Word. You know, God's Word is alive and powerful, right? It speaks to your heart. You know, as you read it, it's reading you. It's amazing what happens as the Word of God can pierce a soul and change a life, right? And I always tell them, to start off reading John. If you have a friend who doesn't know the Lord or a baby Christian, get them to start with John. It will blow their mind because it starts off and declares that Jesus is God, right? And then it goes on in chapter 3 and proclaims, right, that you must be born again. And they may ask you, what does that mean? Well, you can tell him, man. So we start him off reading the book of John, right? And John chapter 1, as we think of the deity of Christ, right? John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and we know that's speaking of Jesus Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He speaking of Jesus Christ, was in the beginning with God. What a what an announcement to know that eternity passed. In creation, Jesus was there with God and involved in creation, right? Amazing, right? He isn't just a man that came in at a certain time. No, from eternity of eternities, he was there with the Father, right? And we'll see that in the next topic. The Trinity was there. The Spirit, Jesus, and God the Father, right? And that says, verse 3, And all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. Speaking of Jesus Christ. But so jump over to verse 14, and it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And we, John says, we beheld him. We saw his glory, the glory of as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What a great way to start off showing that Jesus is God, right? 100% God and 100% man. You know, all the cults out there, they make Jesus a little less than who he is, right? In some areas, they make him less. And uh, that's the error that you have to look at. There's who is Jesus? You know, I was at a, I was at a memorial, and, uh, and the guy's talking about God and reading the scriptures and all this, and oh, he must be a Christian. Oh, he must be. 
few of Christian, and I'm just like, man, I'm just struggling. And so I went up and went in the back and started talking to them and found out that they were of the later day saints, the Mormons, right? And uh, they tried to hide it from me. And, uh, you know, I found out pretty quickly, asked a few questions. And then all these so-called people that I knew that were there, they're, oh, aren't they good, Pastor Steve? They're such, they're Christians. Look, they're quoting God's word. No, they're not Christians, man. They're going to hell. Sorry, right? Just because you quote scriptures doesn't mean you're going to heaven, right? They take it out of context. And they, it seems like so often they want to be like Christians, but they're not Christians, right? they got to be born again. So let's turn to, uh, as we look at, continue to look at the deity, let's go to Isaiah 9-6. I love Isaiah 9-6. These are some verses that you should have memorized. Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6 reminds us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Oh, man. <laughs> he's going to be called God, because he's God, right? He's a God man. He came from eternity past, and we're going to see he was born of a virgin by the Spirit of God, right? And grew up, and guess what? It was God. Right? Amazing. Father of eternities, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, right? Amazing as you go on. Um, let's turn into the, let's go to Micah, I guess. A few passages in the Old Testament. In Micah 5 2, we're told, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrida, though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in, heaven, in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. The key is everlasting, right? Oh man, it's amazing. This one is going to be born in this place. And he's going to be from everlasting, right? Everlasting. And begotten. The first appearance, right? Uh, let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 1. You can correlate this with uh, Isaiah 7, 14. Matthew chapter 1. Verses uh, 20 through 23. We're going to see here the birth of Christ. But while Joseph thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Right? And he will save his people from their sins. Wow. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. See how clear it is? God with us, right? He was conceived, not of Joseph, but of the Holy Spirit, right? It was a miraculous event. It was a, a miracle from God. You know, can you imagine? God's in eternity, past, and all of a sudden he goes, I'm going to take care of the devil myself, right? Steps down from eternity and steps down and becomes a man. Wow. Humbles himself, as we're told, so that he might deal with the devil, right? Oh, man, that's amazing. I love that. Love Jesus. Do you guys love Jesus? Amen. Man, he's worthy to be loved and praised and given all the glory. 
Let's turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and we'll look at verse uh, 60 through 64. So, um, Jesus was going through different trials with the Sanhedrin, with the high priest. And here, in verse 60, it says, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? And Jesus kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. <laughs> I don't know how much clearer it could be. Are you Jesus? I am. I am. <laughs> what a proclamation. I am Jesus. I am the Lord Jesus Christ, right? I am the Messiah. I am the Christos. I am the anointed one. I am the one from eternity past. And I've come to take over, right? Amazing, right? Did Jesus declare he was God? Absolutely. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you the coming one? Are you the anointed one? Are you the God, Emmanuel? I am. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so when he says this, and you see him say it multiple times in Scripture, is he pointing to just like when Moses was spoken to, I am sent you? That's A lot of the phrases, that's exactly what he's saying. Okay. And that's my belief, right? Amen. Especially, um, we'll, we'll cover a couple of them, but what Jesus said before, Abraham was I am. I am. You know, I am. How can you explain God? You know, I, I like to say that these are all in all. He's everything we could ever think of or ask for or want and more. Right? <laughs> you want to say, Moses said, who should I say sent you? I am. I am. <laughs> that declares, you know, he's everything. He can swear by his name. I am, right? Amazing. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Wow, what another proclamation. Not only I am, but guess what? I'm seated, not standing, I'm seated at the right hand of the Father. And not only that, I'm coming in the clouds. Revelation 19, when he comes, what does he do? He wipes out everyone that didn't bow their knee to him. Amazing, right? Amazing. You know, when we were in Israel, Brian and I have been to Israel a few times, preaching the gospel, having fun, telling people about Jesus. And we look, and we, see, we look at the scripture, and we said, man, the blood is going to flow through the valleys. When he comes back, he's just going to whack. Just wipe out everyone. They're done. He gave them every opportunity to come to know him. And they rejected him. They rejected him. They rejected him. And guess what? He's the righteous judge. You know, it's amazing because people will say, well, Jesus, you know, he's the loving God in the New Testament. Oh, man, we haven't read the end story. Yes, he came as a servant, and he laid down his life, but he comes back as king of kings and lord of lords, right? you got to read the end because I love it. In one hour, he destroys all that's on the earth, the purchase, the merchandising. They, it says in Revelation chapter 18 that they traded the bodies and the souls of man. Wow, man, what are they doing? They're trading baby parts and selling souls, right? These men are wicked, right? And they're going to be, they're all going to die. And it's amazing, man. Read Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And then read what happens with us. Because in Revelation 19, guess who's coming with them? We are, right? What does it mean when it says that they trade souls? Like personalities? Or is that trade humans? No, you got to be born again. So are you born again or not? They're going to be convincing everyone not to get born again in every way possible. The devil, what does he do? He blinds the eyes. 
of the souls so that they will not see Jesus. You know, my father, um, real quick, like, um, he didn't believe in Jesus. And uh, by the grace of God, I came to know Jesus Messiah when I was young. My dad uh, allowed my next door neighbor to babysit me. And he took me to Vernon McGee's church in L.A. And from about 8 to 12, I got to know Jesus through Vernon McGee in the Church of L.A. there, L.A. Church of God, I believe it was. Um, and uh, my dad uh, despised the fact that I uh, came to know Jesus, and he didn't allow us to be talk, talk about God or anything in the house. But on his deathbed, he calls me and says, will you come and pray for me? And I said, Dad, you don't believe in God. He goes, but you do. Will you come and pray for me? Yeah. So I came by his bedside and I prayed for him. And he says, you really believe in God, don't you? I believe in Jesus. And he's God. And he's part of the Godhead, right? And a couple weeks later, uh, he gave me this notice that he had about a week or two to live. He had disowned me because I became a Christian, disinherited me, and uh, did a lot of things that were evil. Uh, but in the last couple weeks of his supposed life, by the grace of God, my wife preached the gospel to him. And it was like, as I sat there and prayed, it was like the scales fell off his eyes. And he started to talk about Jesus and ask questions of Jesus. And it's just like the word of God says in 2 Corinthians, that the scales were over his eyes and he fell off. He started asking, he said, when he was in Hebrew school, I was born in Brooklyn. My dad lived in the Bronx. And uh, went to Hebrew school there. He said, they told him, so profound. It was so biblical. It was so true. And by the grace of God, he left this earth shortly thereafter, knowing that Jesus was the Messiah. Right? Amen. Amen. So let's turn to um, Mark chapter, um, or let's turn to Luke, Luke chapter 5. So Jesus is here, and he saw their faith in verse 20, and he said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason, saying, who is this? Who speaks blasphemies? How can he say, right? Your sins are forgiven, right? Only God can forgive, right? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? What's easier? Well, it's way easier to say your sins are forgiven. Who can tell? No one can tell. Who can say, rise up and walk in your name? <clears throat> Only God can say that. It has to be a miracle. But then Jesus said in verse 24, but that you may know that the Son of Man, the title of Jesus Christ, Son of Man, Son of God, right, has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately, he rose up before them all. He had been laying on and departed to the house, glorifying God. Can you imagine? Man, God healed him, man. Who are you? I am the Son of God. I'm the Christ. I'm the coming one. I'm God with man, right? I love it. I love it. A, a proclamation of the deity of Christ, right? Who can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. No one can do it, right? And he can forgive sins, why? 
Because he took all of sin upon himself, right? right? He came and he laid down his life. Wow, can you imagine that? Laid down his life. Remember when he was on his way to the cross? He says, Father, is there any other way? And he's weeping. And he's crying, right? Is there any other way? There wasn't any other way. He had to deal with the wrath of Almighty God. The wrath of sin had a penalty that had to be paid. Either we pay it or someone else pays it. By the grace of God, he took our place. Yes. I just find it interesting that before Jesus made the atonement for sin, he could forgive sin. It's like, that was just weird. It's, why? He's God. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's amazing because a lot of people, I love to teach about Jesus in the Old Testament. They're like, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was only in the New Testament. No way. He's in the Old Testament, right? So he was, it just speaks of his eternity, right? And, you know, just think about this for a second. I love the story. Just think about Saul. What did he do? He was persecuting the church. He was separating Christians. He was going after Christians with all his might, and he thought he was doing it for God. Isn't that amazing? Guess who got one? No. No. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. God, right? <laughs> Jesus stepped out of eternity for a moment and met him and dealt with him. Don't you like that? It's like, hey, he didn't use anybody else. He said, I'm going to take care of this guy Saul myself. Step down, right? Saul's like, oh, who are you, Lord? It's tough kicking against the ghost, isn't it, Saul? Who are you, Lord? What do I do? Right? You know, you're persecuting them, you're persecuting me. I'm the head of the church, right? Right? Man, that speaks volumes to me, right? It's like, wow. I love it because, you know, it just speaks of, you know, God coming down and dealing with me. Yes. I, I know we're in doctrine class, so we were taught um, last week, and he was focusing on just the name Yahweh. And every preacher I've been under, which is Calvary Chapel, uh, they, it's all talking about Jesus, right? Jesus even said in the volume of the book, it is written to me. So the whole main focus of Scripture is to find Jesus in it, not Yahweh. It's to find Jesus because, I mean, it's the same thing, but if we don't find Jesus in the text, that's the whole key thing, right? I mean, that's doctrine, right? Absolutely. And that's why we're going through this. So what is the first class we're teaching on, right? What are we teaching on? We're teaching on uh, the topics. Jesus is the central focus of all worship. Amen. Jesus is the preeminent one, number one, right? What are we doing? Jesus is the one to be praised, right? And then we teach Jesus is God and Jesus in the Trinity. This is the first class. It's all about Jesus. But a lot of people go, they think, here's what they say. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's his first name, middle name, and last name. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you got to understand, he's Lord. He's Master. He is. His name is Jesus. Amen. But Christ is his title, right? It's not his last name. It's his title, who he is, right? In Hebrew, it's Messiah. In Greek, it's Christos, Christ, right? It's the coming one. It's the God-man, right? Yes. And so it's wonderful. And we'll, we'll have a class where I'll teach about Jesus in the Old Testament. It's mind-blowing. Because as soon as I do that, it's like, so many people that are Christians, they have no idea. I go, in the volume of the book is written about me. Genesis is written about Jesus. Exodus is written. You know, and, and for me, as an early Christian, I can tell you a story about, I was listening to John Corson, he says, Christ is on every page. Jesus Christ, and I went, he is not. And I'm looking at him, <laughs> and I literally got in my car and drove to Applegate, because I was going to argue with John Corson. Right? I was like, I was a student, I was like, he's not there. And uh, praying all the way up, I didn't end up seeing him at the time. We ended up becoming friends, and his uh, daughter worked for me, and I almost went on staff there at Applegate. But anyway, I met his assistant, and he started to open my eyes to the truth about Christ in the Old Testament. And it was amazing for me to study that, and it was amazing for me to see, you know, Christ.
Christ appearing in the Old Testament, right? Christophanies of Christ, right? And there's all different kinds of things, that, you know, that are there. But it's amazing. We're going to get to it. We've we got to get to it. We're going through doctrine. So you guys are getting ahead of ourselves here. You have a quick question. Well, that question is going ahead of us. Today. Um, yeah. On the mountain of Sinai, when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments, was that God or was that Jesus? Jesus was there. Was, was it God who we saw like the back of? Or was that? Just the Father. Was I, think it was the, I think it was the Father, but I'm not. We'll, we'll get to it. I just you got to remember too. You, you you have the Father. You got the Godhead. See, we we're getting ahead of ourselves. We got we we got Jesus is God, but he's part of the Godhead, right? The Godhead is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Remember, it's um, when you think of the Trinity, right? It's important to understand this concept that we can't understand. We have all these different expressions of it, but they, they don't do justice to the reality of who they are. And they have roles, and they're independent, but they're united, right? It's amazing. <laughs> we're getting ahead of ourselves with these questions because we're going to be dealing with a lot of this in the future. You have a quick, quick question? Yeah, I just I didn't want to get ahead. I just wanted to concrete something because the way we were taught last week, it like totally bothered me because he was putting up Yahweh above Jesus. But he says, I magnify my word above my name, right? And so that's Christ himself. And so the main focus of whatever we're doing is to find Christ and to teach and preach Christ, right? But remember, he's part of the Godhead. Amen. Yeah. So when you worship the Godhead, you're worshiping Christ. Mm-hmm. Right? So so you don't want to make you don't want to make such a distinction that you're not allowing, and we're going to cover this, that God, the Father, is God. Mm-hmm. Right? And so uh, you want to worship him. He's worthy to be worshipped, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's important to 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 um, kind of get the fullness of that. That's why we start off with Jesus, because, you know, it's the most, it's the most critical part of being a Christian. If you don't understand Jesus, you can't be saved. You're not going to heaven. Mm-hmm. You can understand all you can, like the Jews. Uh, I, I, I'm with a, 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 a Jew guy, a Jewish man, um, he did the locksmith, and he was raised in Israel. I think about 25 years old, he came over here. So I'm sharing with him. And he goes, I'm so confused. I'm a Jew and you're a Jew. Right? Yeah. He goes, but you're a pastor. What does that mean? And I explained to him, I go, I'm a completed Jew. I put my trust in Jesus. Right? And, uh, Is that like the Romans, like a uh, true Jew? Is that what you're referring to? There's different ways. But, you know, I'm Jewish. And I've come come to know the Messiah, and so now I'm a Christian. I put my trust in a Jew, <laughs> and it blew his mind, just like my father blew his mind. How can you be Jewish and be a Christian? It just seems like it's they're opposing views, right? And so I got to share with them about putting my trust in the Messiah, right? Jesus, right? And, and so we're going to talk further about planting seeds, right, in that mess. You guys have lots of questions. Right. We're going to be going through a lot of it. Let's, um, all right. Where are we at? Mm, uh, Luke 5, <coughs> 20. We just read that, right? Yeah, we just read it. We just read it. Yeah, okay. And he glorified God, you know, the paralyzed man. Okay, let's turn to... Um, Let's cover 21 through 26 so so we can get the context. So Jesus says to her, the woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Your worship, what you do, not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, where where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the woman, this is really important, the woman said to him, speaking to Jesus, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said, I am the Messiah. <laughs> wow, Jesus said, I who speak to you am he, right? I mean, did Jesus say he was the Messiah? Absolutely, right? I mean, come on. Why do people say, hey, he never said he was the Messiah? We're just reading these paths. Do people read the Bible? Right? No, and, and what's amazing is this woman, right? Woman at the well, you know, she's a Samaritan. We're told in verse 7. And she understood clearly the Messiah is coming, right? We know the Messiah is coming, right? You know, Wow, he's called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. Wow, Jesus said, I am the Messiah. <laughs> I love that, man. Know these scriptures, underline these scriptures. So when somebody comes and says, Jesus isn't God, you need to be able to go through the scriptures and be able to explain that Jesus is God. And I'll go to my favorite one uh, as we close here. First, first uh, Colossians. Let's go to Colossians. I always take people here because uh, you want to exalt Christ. You want to show people that he's God. Take them to Colossians chapter 1. Let's start at verse 13. You have to get a good grip on the pronouns here, and I'll probably just uh, give you the pronouns. Verse 13. He, speaking of the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us to the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, speaking of the Son, the forgiveness of sins, Verse 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven. Wait a minute, I thought God created all things. God did create all things. Jesus was there in the creation. He was there with God the Father. He was there with the Holy Spirit. He was there, right? Before time was, before anything was, he was there. All things were created that were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through who? And Jesus. And for him, Jesus. Right? Man! Wow, watch what it, go watch what it goes on to say. And Jesus is above all things. And in Jesus, all things consist. You know how everything is held together? By Jesus. You know who was involved in creation? Jesus. You know who was the beginning of everything? Jesus, right? Now, the whole Godhead was there. But here's the key. Most people don't understand that Jesus was a participant in all of that, right? And he's still involved in holding all things together, right? You know, it's amazing because... I, I was listening to a study a while back, and I go, we don't understand the Adam. What holds the Adam together? What do you think holds the Adam together? Jesus. Jesus, right? <laughs> God, right? Yeah, but yeah, I was just going to kind of piggyback off what you said. I saw a, uh, this one guy preaching a, a, ser a sermon on exactly what you're talking about, right now, how Jesus holds everything together. And he, and he asked, like, um, what kind of cell holds all the atoms together? And I was like, well, no, and I forget the scientific term for it, but it's all like, He's like, here's a picture of it, and it literally looks like a cross. Laminate. And then he, and then laminate. Yeah, that's what it is. Yes, yes. And then he's all like, Jesus. Here's a here's a picture of uh, of an actual one, and when he showed it, it still looked like a cross, but it looked like someone was carried. <laughs> and I was all like, No way, man! Like <laughs> when I first saw it, I was I was blown away. I was like, man. There's so many things that um, the intricacies and the designer. And the creation that's amazing, and hopefully we'll get a chance to cover this. But let me go on, because you think 
that's amazing? Watch the next couple verses because it just, it totally brings to life who Jesus is. Watch this. Verse 18, and Jesus is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In all things, Jesus may have preeminence. Again, the number one spot, right? He's the only mediator between man and God, right? You want to get to God? Who do you go to? Jesus. There's only one person. That's, who, that's why it's so critical to know Jesus. But watch, this is amazing. The next verse, I'd love to read it. It says, For please the Father, that in Jesus all the fullness shall be. It pleased the Father. You know, see, so many people, they don't understand the difference between the Father and Jesus. And so many people have misinterpreted and misrepresented the Father when it was about Jesus, right? But here, beautiful picture. You know, uh, when I had my two boys, I got two boys, 24 and 20. Uh, both love the Lord, praise God, and uh, walking with the Lord. And, um, you know, when I was young, a young man, I didn't want to be married. I was an entrepreneur. And all that, and um, but God, as a Christian, He says, "I want you to be married." And brought my wife, and then when I had my first son, you know, it was amazing the transformation that happens when you kind of take care of a, a, a son, when you're raising somebody, when you're responsible for someone, and truly, it helped me to understand God. It helped me to understand being a father, right? And here we see the father was pleased that in his son or in Jesus Christ right the second in the Godhead the second in the Trinity that all the fullness shall grow man that's amazing and then verse 20 and by Jesus to reconcile all things to himself by Jesus whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross now I argue with people you know, in fact, I want to go through a couple more passages, but you know, you can see the pronoun when it talks about the blood, his suffering, right? The cross. It's not God the Father that died on the cross. You know who died on the cross? Jesus, right? He demonstrated his love towards us, right? Demonstrated it. He made it real by what he did, right? What he did for us. You know, you're going to learn everything is reconciled at the cross. No matter what people come to me at whatever direction, I can resolve it. You know how they resolve it? The cross. <laughs> the cross resides, resolves all the issues of life. In fact, John Fortune came to a, to a, a class when I was in Marietta, or Twin Peaks at the time, in the early 90s, and he came and was so excited. He goes, I got the answer to every question. And he had like 20 of the most asked questions that he's been asked as a pastor. And every question was answered at the cross. The cross answers every question. Okay? Because the cross gives humanity life everlasting with God. No matter what you suffered, no matter what you've been through, no matter what hardships you've been, no matter who you know, somebody died, a child died, no matter what happened on this side, it's all resolved in eternity. And the reconciliation is through the blood and the cross and the resurrection and the seed of the hand of the Father. All right. Let's pray and take a break. And then we'll have one more thing to cover, right? Um, Speaking of the Trinity, right? Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you and we love you and we worship you. Lord, you're the one to receive all the glory. You're, we want to be able to show people that Christ, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Christ, that he's Emmanuel, that he's the Christos, that he's the anointed one. He's the Messiah to come. He's God, the Savior of the world, the Savior of the people, Lord. And so, Lord, may we... Uh, know these scriptures and be able to teach people who Jesus is. That he's fully God and he's fully man. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
hey, I love, I love witnessing these Jehovah Witnesses. I'm the worst. I'm the worst <laughs> man I have. But in Haiti, they got these, these, these Jehovah Witnesses that come in. And um, I stop and I, and I, they're there, you know, with all their little watchtowers, right? The 144,000, you know, they're going to make it, right? But they're passing out their watchtowers on Saturday so they can be the 144,000. 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, but they're the 144, right? So anyway, so, and I sit down and I, and I, and I, I go, Jay-Z single J. Oh, man, you see, it's like throwing a rock into a pile of dog. <laughs> you know, the Jay-Z, I say, Jesus is God, right? Jay-Z single J, Jay-Z single J. And they start coming after us. Get him out of here, right? Get out of here, they're going crazy, right? <laughs> Jesus is God. No, Jesus is a God, right? I love it. And um, so if you go to Isaiah chapter 44, you, you know, you're, you got, you got, you're witnessing to Jehovah witnessing. In, in verse 6, it says, you go, hey, let, let me ask you this. Who is this? And they go, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and besides me, there is no God. You go, who's that talking about? Jehovah. That's Jehovah. Okay? We'll go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. It says, so Revelation chapter 1. Oh, wait, let's go to, um, oh, let's go, yeah. Revelation chapter 1. Uh, let's see what we're at here. Verse 18 it says, so it says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. You know who that's talking about? That's Jehovah. First and the last, right? It says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Who's that? That's Jesus, right? He was dead and he was alive. Amen. And so, I love it, man. So, you know, it's so important to know that Jesus is God, right? It says in Genesis 1.26, in the creation, he said, let us create man in our image. Amen. And I love, I love John. It's just, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made through him. Nothing that was made was made without him. And then in 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. It was Jesus, right? And um, I love how, how Steve said it, you know, God, Jesus is fully God and fully man. And um, if you ever have any spare time, you know, you don't know, oh man, what can I read? Read Philippians chapter 2. I love that chapter. Amen. And let's just read it here. It says, um, let this mind be in you, we're starting in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeliness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Amen. Even the death of the cross, therefore God also has highly exalted him. And given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and that of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Man, isn't that it's like let this mind be in you, right? He did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. I love, I love it in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, in chapter 7, it says, And the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall be with child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen? Amen. And Steve quoted Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name is uh, wonderful, right? Everlasting God, right? <laughs> Amen. He's God, right? And so, praise the Lord, man. Jesus is, um, Jesus even said, you know, to the religious leaders, 
You search the scriptures, right? What are they talking about? The Old Testament. And in them you think that you have life, but these are which testify of me, as he said, I have come in the volume of the book. It's written in me, the Old Testament. Yahweh, right? Amen. They run through Yahweh. They didn't want to pronounce the name of God they, because it was so holy. But that's God, right? He was, um, uh, I love it in, uh, let's see, we're in, um, in the book of John, 1 John. Let's see if I can find it here. Oh, it says in uh, 1 John chapter 8, for these, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Amen. Amen. Great is the mystery of God, and as God was manifested in the flesh, believed on in the world, justified, uh, seen among angels, and received up in glory. Amen. Yes. What was that reference again? Oh, that one is uh, first, it was in John. 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, another good one for the Jehovah Witnesses is Hebrews 1, 8. Hebrews 1, 8 says, and to the Son, he says, your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. Oh, man, how did they get around that one? <laughs> to the Son, he says, your throne, O oh God. Amen. And um, Jesus, it's, it's amazing because um, the cults always do something to Jesus. Right? And, and, and the, the, Jehovah, the Mormons and the Latter-day Saints, man, they are so deceptive. We were watching a movie. My Christian, my mom, my wife is like, it, they, they come off as like, oh yeah, we're we're Christians, man. and they're liars, right? I mean, they don't believe Jesus is God. They 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 do not believe that Jesus is God. And, and it's uh, I take my little babies and we drive by a Mormon church. I go, you see that church? They go, yeah. I go, bad church. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cool. We drive it. Hey, Dad, there's another bad church. <laughs> Right, but why? Because there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. And who's Jesus? You, you know, you can believe there's a lot of Jesuses. You know, there's a lot of guys coming up from Mexico. Saying, hey, what's your name? I work with guy. What's your name? Jesus. Well, Jesus. <laughs> That's not going to save me, right? That's the wrong Jesus. Some people they the dog Jesus. <laughs> But that ain't the Jesus who saves. The Jesus who saved is God. Amen? Amen. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And um, he's the one that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Amen? Amen? So that's the Jesus we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus who is God. Hey, you had a question over here? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering. So my, everybody on my dad's side of the family, or the majority of them, are Mormons. And so what would be just a couple quick tips for administering to them? Because it's really, really hard to be family and then to be like so close and yet at the same time so far away. Yeah. And so. Man, it's, um, you know, Paul said, um, if we or an angel from heaven come and preach to you any other gospel, let it be a curse. And uh, I was just in a hotel room not too long ago. There was a Book of Mormon in there, which we quietly put in a bag and we moved it through the trash. <laughs> um, but there was also a Bible in there. But on the Book of Mormon, you know what it says? The Book of Mormon, another gospel. <laughs> Paul said, hey, even if we are an angel from heaven preached to you any other gospel, let it be a curse. Mm -hmm. Man, you got to just preach Christ. you got to let them know uh, that Jesus is God, that every knee will bow, that every tongue will confess. And Paul said, hey, I'm determined not to know anything among you against Jesus Christ, right? And the right Jesus. Yeah. Amen. We gotta just preach Christ because that's the gospel that He died for you, um, that He was buried and He rose again, and um, that's how people get saved. Amen. Amen. It's uh, you know you were talking about um, my friend had a guy. Um, he was he he had one of his workers was a Jehovah Witness an elder of the Jehovah Witness Church, right? Twenty five years or something, and he said, Hey, I'm gonna hire you for the day, and I want you to witness to the guy. And I like the guy, but man, he's just so wrapped up. So I go, okay. 
So he tells my friend, my friend's a Christian, he's going to work with you. So we already knew there was going to be a fight, right? So, you know, <laughs> so we, 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 I'm driving, and this guy's he's in the passenger seat, and we load up, and uh, we're heading out, and there's like, you know, 10 minutes of total silence in the car. Who's going to throw the first blow, right? And um, it was amazing, because I didn't, you know, I, I, the, the, you, you can't really share scriptures uh, scripture with them. Because he can't understand the scriptures. The natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit, nor can he understand them. They're foolishness. He can't understand it, right? He can't, if he's not born again, he cannot even understand it. And so, so the guy said something, and then I said, the first thing I said, I mean, you know, I wasn't even planned. I said, are you born again? He goes, what do you mean born again? I go, Jesus said, you must be born again. To see the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom of God. And he goes, Yeah, but I want, I want you to go to this scripture and that scripture. I go, Listen, if you're not born again, you can't even understand the scriptures because the natural man cannot receive the things of God, nor can he understand them. And you go, Well, go over here to here. And listen, you, you can't even understand what that says unless you're born again. I go, When was the day that you were born again? You will know when you're. And so I was like, and man, all they want, all they, all they would hit me was like, oh, hey, you got to be born again, man. Don't talk to me about the Bible. <laughs> You'll know if you're born again. And Jesus said, you must be born again. And so we had a day and he was like, man. And he's like, I mean, you know, I go, yeah, you can be born again right now. All you need to do is believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross for you and he rose again. And then you can receive Christ. Your body becomes the temple of God. The spirit of God will dwell in you. And then you'll understand the scriptures. He said, oh, man. I, he, goes, I, he, he really wanted to. Goes, what am I going to tell him? I go, there's a guy in the school of ministry. 20 years in the, as a Jehovah Witness. He got born again. And now he's left that and he's set free. He's like, oh, man. you got to be born again, man. Don't. But every time he came out, man, don't even talk to me about scriptures. You can't understand them unless you're born again. And it worked great. At the end of the day, I go, oh, man, I guess I got to be born again. I go, oh, man, keep working on it, man. I just had a story with, like, the Book of Mormon and then the Bible. So our next-door neighbors is the Mormon family. My little brother, he's 10. I think he was 9 at the time. The little girl saw, um, my other little girl saw the Holy Bible sitting there. She told him, she's like, that's not the Holy Bible. He's like... Yes, it is. She's like, no, our Bible is the Holy Bible. And he's like, well, we believe it's, we believe it's the Word of God. And she looked at him like, huh? <laughs> but it's like, it, it, it's oh. just, it's so cute how my little siblings even like they know that this is the Word of God. And I, Amen. I share that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's really, I mean, you think about that. These people are saying that Jesus isn't God, man. It's like, man, yes, He is, right? Um, hey, listen, uh, we know um, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. And um, this is Jesus is um, he's he's above he's, his name is above every name. God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name. And um, he's the one that we call on. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. And hey, and Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father apart from me. Amen? Mm -hmm. Jesus is the only thing that matters. When you're dying or when you're in trouble, the Jesus of the Bible, you know, the Jesus who's God, right? And unto us a son is born, unto us um, a child is born, unto us a son is born, and unto us a child is given. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Amen? That's who we worship. That's who we serve. And that's who our help comes from. Amen? Amen. All right. You know, I'll, I'll just piggyback on that for a second. But, um, you know, when we look at, just so you know, where this is being taught is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, right? It's a very important passage. And I think it's relevant to us right now. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we'll look at 10 through 14 because uh, this is where I go to. You know, um, Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ. You know, as I'm witnessing and sharing with people, you know, all that matters to me 
Are they born again? And I don't want to talk to them about anything else except born again. That's it. You know, there's so many of the friends I know uh, that don't know the Lord, and they're silenced. Because why are they silenced? Because I stay with the simplicity of Christ and the cross. Paul, man, this mighty man of God, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what did he determine? What did I determine? I determined you must be born again. That's what the scripture says. The only way you get born again is by believing in Jesus, right? And so Paul in chapter 2, verse 2 says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, many come in verse 4 with speech and preaching and persuasive words and human wisdom, right? None of that matters. It doesn't matter. All these super educated people, they're educated beyond their understanding. Because the simplicity is Christ, right? And um, we need to have that. We need to understand that verse 5, for instance, 4 and 5, says, Paul came with demonstration of the spirit and power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. The power of God. The power of God will save us all. Philosophy won't save anyone. Man's wisdom won't do anything. It's the power of God that will save a soul. And you know, for us, we can't save a soul. I can't save a soul. Brian can't save a soul. You can't save a soul. Jesus saves the soul. <laughs> Jesus is the one that saves the soul, right? He's the only mediator between man and God. There's no other mediator. There's no other mediator. It's one. So with knowing that, knowing that, that truth, what do you want to tell people? You must be born again. Now let's go down to the passage I was mentioning. Set 1 Corinthians chapter 2, further down, verse 10, it says, But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. Okay, all of us are born again, Lord willing. We're going to continue to preach Christ in this class. Even last time I taught it, I preached Christ at the end. Okay? I don't know if you're saved or not. Many have a head knowledge, not a heart transformation. There's a lot of fakers, a lot of phonies. I can't tell. Uh, God knows. Praise God. Right? So we got to keep preaching the truth, right? So that's what we do. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit of God searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. You cannot know the things of God unless you're born again and have the Spirit of God who teaches you all things, right? He goes on to say, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world. Man, I have three or four kids that I, I minister to. They have the Spirit of the world. They're super educated. They're educated beyond their own understanding. Because what, what the beginning of knowledge is what? Fear of the Lord, reverence of the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is to know Jesus Christ, right? Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 8, right? Talks about the beginning, the first step. If you don't know Jesus, you have no wisdom. If you don't have, if you don't know Jesus, you have no knowledge. You know what wisdom and knowledge is found? In Jesus. Okay? Colossians 2, 3. Jesus is where all wisdom and knowledge is found. It's in a person, it's in a relationship. It's not in the college you go to, or the school you go to, or the degree you have, or who taught you. It's in Jesus. You know, I know people that they constantly get educated, but they never come to know Jesus. You know people like that? Just educated, educated, educated. When do you get educated? Foolishness, false knowledge, false wisdom. Because the basis and foundation of wisdom and knowledge is Jesus. That's the start. That's the first step. That's the starting out. So verse 13 tells us, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Guess what? They've been freely given. You can't buy it. You can't get educated to attain it. 
You can't inherit it from somebody else, right? It must be freely given by Jesus. Then 13, these things also we speak not in words which man's person teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comp comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, here's what Brian was talking about, the natural man, the old man, the old nature, those born under Adam, which is everyone, except for Jesus, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to them, nor can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Because we are born again of the Spirit of God in our own us. So when you talk to people, why do you have any kind of argument? Just take them right to the cross. Just take them right to the gospel. It's great. Be determined. They'll come, hey, see, I want to know about this. Wait, wait. Are you born again? Oh. Well, let's get the first things first. <laughs> you may must be born again. Well, no, I want to talk about this and that and that. That's I don't want to talk. Are there aliens? Are there other planets? You know, what about this? You know, what about that manifestation? Is Mary God? You know, what, is, is she a virgin? You know, talk about all these things. Wait, 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 bro. <laughs> the most important thing, most important thing, are you born again? If you're not born again, you will not understand the things of God. It's all just That's a critical part. What was that? 
What's the passage? It's 1 John 4, verse 2 and 3. Turn to, uh, let me see. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. This is a really good passage. 2 Timothy uh, 2, 24. You know, early in my life, I thought I had to save people. If you think you have to save people, you'll be a coward and fear will grab you. You don't have to save anybody. It's the Spirit of God that brings people to salvation. Remember that? It's Jesus that brings people to salvation. It's God that brings people to salvation. What we're required to do is share the good news. Let the Spirit of God work. Plant the seeds. You know? Tell the truth. Give them the good news. But watch this. This is very important. And you know, sometimes people are so intimidated about sharing the gospel. When Brian and I come up here, we'll share the gospel along the way. In fact, I was going to like one of these times when uh, when we see somebody, me and Brian, we run outside. You guys can watch us or follow us, and we'll go share the gospel with somebody walking down the street. Just That's what we do. Amen. Right? That's what you do. Right? When you have the good news, what do you do? You share it. You have the greatest news for mankind. You have the only hope for mankind, right? I'm often ashamed as I meet with people and I say, when was the last time you shared the gospel? And, mm -hmm. What's wrong with you? Do you really believe? You know what Jesus said? If you don't confess me, Father in heaven, right? You know, are we afraid of the gospel of God? The devil wants you to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. We don't have to beat anybody. You know? We just talk to them about the truth, the good news, the thing that saved me. What a wretch. And gave me a relationship with God and eternity with God where no sin, no death. Oh man, it's going to be glorious, right? But watch this, in 2 uh, first, second Timothy, uh, verse 24. This is a good word for us tonight. And the servant, or the Christian, or the Bible called students, men and women of the Lord, must not quarrel. Are you guys quarreling? Be critical, argumentative, don't do it. You know, but... Be gentle to all, able to teach, be patient, and humility, correcting those who are in opposition. That's what we want to do. We're gentle, we're patient, we're prayerful, we're not critical, argumentative, yelling, screaming. We're just lovingly presenting the good news. So that God, perhaps, will grant them repentance. Who grants them repentance? God. 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 It's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is just to share the good news and not do the rest. Right? Some water, right? Some plant. And who does the increase? God does the increase, right? Be a part of the, the planting and the sowing. <coughs> So that they may know the truth. Watch this, verse 26. That they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by them <coughs> to do his will. You know, I was, I was teaching a Bible study last night. I was teaching another Bible study last night. My wife hates it because um, I call people a fool. And they, I love to do it. <laughs> Some people need the shock treatment. They think more highly of themselves than they ought to. And I can tell sometimes my wife cringes because I'll be talking to somebody, something like, you know what? You're a fool. And they're like, Pastor Steve, what? you're a fool. The Bible says a fool is said in the heart there is no God. You don't believe in God. The Word of God says you're a fool. <laughs> and, and just see what they say. I don't think sometimes when I talk, they've never heard anybody call them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, I'm just telling you what God says you are. You, know, you cannot know the things of God. You are a fool.
old. How can you be in this world and not recognize the creator of all things? I mean, it's, I can tell you why. Because you don't want to be accountable. You're denying the spirit of God's work on your heart and mind because of your own selfish, selfish reasons. Right? Romans 1 tells us that uh, even though they knew God, what they do? They did not want to glorify him as God and became futile in their mind and their foolish hearts were darkened. And they were to be wise, they became as fools. They worshiped the creature instead of the creation. Right? Instead of the creator. Right? Psychology. Humans. I'll tell you one last story. You know, close. <coughs> my dad would come to my room, and I have on, on the picture, I have this monkey, 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 boy, monkey, 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 man. And I had a massive picture. <coughs> and my dad would come on my door. Hey, dad, your quick picture, your quick grandfather was a monkey. He would get so mad. Because he was so precious, and he was so selfish. Never, he could never deal with that. But you know, people sometimes need to know what what do they believe in? It came from the goop. It came from an explosion. Order was put together. It came from a fish to a worm to a snake, and then you have a monkey, and then you follow the monkey. <laughs> the tree of life. It's being taught in schools. Do you believe it? Mm -hmm. I actually, as a young boy, they took me to the museum in L.A., and there was all these monkey men. I didn't believe it. Not one kid. I was born again. And so, Dad, this is what you believe. <clears throat> right over my bed. Every day, it's like, Dad, this is your Your great, great, great grandfather is a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Spirit.